Knowledge is not a science, but a state, the state of identification. To be identified with something is to be united with it and made one with it. Identification can take place between states of being of the same type, but these, like liquids of the same density, will interpenetrate naturally. Thought communicates with thought, emotion with emotion, and passion with passion of the same kind. And this is why, between individuals or groups, thought, emotion, and passion can be communicated without words. No individual can communicate with another on a wavelength which the latter does not possess. For example, a man cannot transmit a moral, intellectual, or religious emotion to an animal, since the latter cannot vibrate, as it were, on that wavelength. A wild creature, when it meets a traveler, knows by instinct whether his intentions toward it are friendly or aggressive, because it has such feelings itself. But it will pick up the emotional or passional condition of the man, not his thought or reasoning or plan of attack. The man, on the other hand, can use his reasoning power to guess at the intentions of the animal, but he will rarely understand its feelings, because his own mental activity prevents him from communicating with it on that level. Knowledge is thus the state of identification with a condition or a function. Now function is a particular modality of consciousness. Every species in nature is characterized by certain functions and modalities, which constitute its innate or instinctive consciousness. This instinctive consciousness is, for an animal, its knowledge, that is to say, its state of being identified with the conditions and functions of its kind. This direct knowledge is different from the intellectual apprenticeship of learned knowledge, which comes from the exercise of observation memory, deduction, and technique. The newborn kitten, though blind, suckles by the light of nature. It is identified with a function of its kind, and this it knows directly. But later on, the place where the saucer of milk is put will have to be learned. The bounds of knowledge are much wider in man, because he possesses the elements, or at least the listening posts, of higher states than the physical, emotional, and mental. For these higher states are the projection in the human being of the same states of being in the cosmos. Identification, however, is more difficult for man than for animal, because the egocentricity of his personal consciousness, the permanent witness, prevents him from wanting to be identified with anything but himself and equally because the rational mind restricts the automaton to the rational way of using the mind, and will not allow it to tune in to any mode of thought superior to its own. For mode of thought, we might say vibrations. All this is metaphor. The identification most commonly in force is that of the automaton, with its lower states, the physical, emotional, and intellectual, while the permanent witness remains inactive except for a general urge toward anything that can inflate the ego. When this happens, the impressions derived from each of the three lower states are vaguely felt by the other two, so that physical pains and other sensations become confused with emotions, and judgments or opinions are given under the influence of an exhilaration or depression, which is of physical or emotional origin. This confusion controls the individual's behavior. Neither of the two real forms of consciousness, the personal or the spiritual, can throw any light upon it, because he would not hear them if they spoke, and he has no studied principle whereby to classify impressions according to their causes. Neither the permanent witness nor the spiritual witness can interfere with this chaos of impressions 
because its principles, or its wavelength, are different from theirs. They cannot, that is, except by provoking some violent shock, which will surprise the automaton into contact with one of the two witnesses, before the rational mind has time to react. This contact gives the automaton an impression of light and vital force, which vitally it will want to find again, and this is why a sudden moral or spiritual transformation sometimes occurs after a violent emotion, a serious illness, or an escape from death. These shocks are a means frequently employed by one or the other witness consciousness to shake the automaton out of its lethargy and take the rational mind by surprise. One must not forget that this proceeding, by the repetition of suitable shocks, can eventually keep the automaton under the control of one of its witnesses. The choice between these, and indeed the possibility of such a thing at all, are to be illustrated in the present work. Its object is to awaken man from his mortal slumber and put his automaton into the service of the two witnesses, in such manner and measure as shall be required for the attainment of ultimate deliverance. The result should be an acquisition of true knowledge, which will naturally be proportionate to the quality of the consciousness awakened and to the degree of identification. All functions and states of being can become objects of knowledge. The innate human consciousness includes all the functional consciousnesses, which are the framework of nature. For man being the microcosm of the macrocosm, all states of being in the cosmos are projected in him. In other words, he has in himself all the possibilities of knowledge, and it is in himself that he should look for them. Not even the best teacher can present one with consciousness, or fill one with knowledge, but in a man suitably disposed, it is possible to arouse reactions which will lead in the right direction. Often it is useful to prepare the ground by clarifying essential ideas in order to get rid of prejudices. But the most effective instruction is that which leads the seeker to put his problems clearly to himself, so that then he can find the answer for himself in meditation. Here, we shall try to practice alternately the two methods, explanation and stimulation, trusting that the reader will accept our meditative reflections as the somewhat simple method, in fact, the simplest possible method, of gradually approaching that simplicity of heart and mind to which the kingdom of heaven has been promised. Here there is no longer any author or reader. There is or let us hope there is, only consciousness. And the consciousness of I and you is, let us hope, a little piece of the universal consciousness, unless indeed it is only an elucidation of my thinking brain, which pretends to be myself. How can I tell? That which I think I know is that which my thought has recognized as evidential, but it has sometimes happened that certain evidence has been impugned by later scientific discovery. This quote, myself, which thinks it understands, is an activity of the brain. The myself which thinks it wills may be the impulse of some urge of passion or of some unrecognized mental suggestion. And the myself which thinks it loves has loved so many different things that I doubt whether it is always the same itself. I might doubt. Who then is this I? Who asks this question? Who is speaking now? Is it that I have doubts about myself? Or does I doubt it? Is I myself? If it were, how could it be ignorant of myself's intentions. And if myself were to die now, would I be still there asking, 
Who am I? Discussion cannot solve this problem. I accuses the incoherent myself of not revealing the motives of its behavior. Sometimes it thinks as I thinks. Sometimes it does what I does not like. And its acts are inconsistent, as if there were several me's acting at their own whims or under some outside influence. But to be able to take note of this seems to give I an advantage over the multifarious myself, the advantage that it can agree or refuse to be identified with the impulses arising in myself. This means that it is a conscious being, and to be conscious of self is to know oneself. Can the I know itself? And if it is I who speak, who are you who listen? Are you your myself, or are you your I? Where will all this analysis lead me if I continue in this vein? Why my personality will seem so rich and complex, my brain will be filled with a wealth of new notions and myself will take the glory of it. I could no doubt take myself by surprise if I were to insist on analyzing out my physical mechanism, my emotional impulses, and the unresting whirlpool of my thoughts and imaginations. But what part does the I play in all this dissection? And again, if this I were a unit, a consciousness, with one unalterable mode of expression, one would expect that all these analyses would, in the end, reveal its presence. But it does not take much experiment to convince one that there is a duality in one's guiding impulses. Some are pitilessly personal, and seem to intensify the individual's egoism and some show a spirit of altruism, which will sacrifice the self for a pure ideal. Is there any hope of discovering in oneself a factor of permanent stability, a managing director of one's incarnation, aware of its goal and able to enlighten us concerning the route toward it? This brings us back to the threshold of our original anxiety, but regarding the object of our quest, we have made a little progress. We have had a glimpse of the real meaning of consciousness, and of its eminence in all being. Animals are controlled by it, but man, when the automatic life does not satisfy him, wants something more. His legitimate pride, as a candidate for higher realms, seeks instinctively for some element of certainty in himself which could put an end to the duel between his two contradictory tendencies. This, alas, is a hopeless dream in the duality of the natural world. Yet that which is impossible to the natural man is possible to one who has awakened in himself the spiritual witness. For although its presence does not exclude that of the permanent witness, it is the means of further evolution for the latter, and where it predominates, the superhuman state can be attained, and one may then speak of a single consciousness, permanent and mortal, in which the struggle is no longer discord, but simply experience seeking through choice an increase of knowledge. Until that is attained, we have to admit our duality, and not stifle our anxiety, by a cowardly acceptance of our own automatism. After all, the cause of our anxiety is ignorance, and the incoherence of the guidance we can give ourselves, and no theorizing will solve the difficulty. So following faithfully in the course mapped out, we must eliminate all complexity, fix our attention on the heart of the problem, and rediscover the simplicity of a child. Let us try for a few moments to establish some sort of mediation between I, you, and the others. Whoever is speaking or listening, I is to be the one who speaks. You is to be the one who listens. 
let us make no further distinctions and try to establish a means of mediation. When a child suckles, the milk is the mediation between heaven which gives and the flower which receives. Light is the mediation. The mystery is the assimilation of that which is received and absorbed. But the child does not think of the mystery, it simply sucks, and the flower does not think of the mystery, it simply opens at whatever time it can receive what it requires. This is wisdom, wisdom which knows the necessary gesture to perform the necessary function at the necessary moment. If there is no opposition or dissociation, then gesture, function, and wisdom are one in giver and receiver. A child has this innate knowledge so long as it has not left the kingdom of heaven. An infant is not in hope of the kingdom of heaven so long as it has not quitted the state of innocence, which is non-differentiation. It is in the kingdom of heaven. On quitting it, it will painfully have to learn discrimination, what to do and what not to do. In fact, the hard task of the man with two wills, who cannot distinguish between the voices of the two witnesses when they whisper to him contradictory advice. But later, of course, things will be simpler. The permanent witness will be the only one he listens to. But you and I know this drama and are tired of submitting blindly. So let us try now to discover consciously the key of the kingdom that we have lost. Let us try to listen as a child listens to that vibration in the depths of one's breast which corresponds to the conception of a reality. Let us try as a child tries until it happens. To try is in itself to free oneself from the habit-bound will and to enlarge the scope of one's intuitive powers. Listen, then. Listen unremittingly. Watch the flower open just when it needs the sun. Watch its desire. Watch that in yourself which seeks in order to discover who the seeker is and what you seek. Watch the invisible and slowly your interior vision will open, just as your eyes accustom themselves to see in darkness. Our principal resistance is fear of being deceived, of escaping from the control of our intellectual faculties. But one can reply to this, that sense perception and false reasoning can also cause delusions. That, however, is part of the world you know, and its verification must be studied elsewhere. For the present, we want to set ajar a door into a world which you did not know existed within yourself. It has sometimes swung open a little without your knowledge, but that has been more shocking than to open it deliberately. Knowledge is not to learn and file somewhere in the brain notions, which will vanish when the brain cells die. Knowledge is to open one's eyes to the nature of a thing, as if one were born into it, so that this perception awakens awareness of that in ourselves, which is analogous to it. If I put myself in a state of complete mental and physical relaxation, if I do not attempt to believe or profess to know, then I can hear in myself the overtones of that which I wish to know just as a harp sounds all the overtones of the note one touches. Experience has shown that the doctor who in imagination can identify himself with his patient will prescribe an effective treatment, just as the mountaineer, the explorer, and the lion tamer can avoid the dangers which they have felt approaching and have been experiencing in imagination. But to teach this condition consciously, one must deliberately abandon the fruitless discussions caused by a variety of doctrines and opinions. One must renounce controversy and quarreling and march by the single star that hangs over the cradle of the child. 
And this is your own star, that of the child which slumbers in you, awaiting its awakening. To discover the straight course which is your own and not another's, you must set out simple in mind, the head and memory empty, and the heart on fire with longing, to open yourself unconstrainedly, and the eyes as easily astonished as those of an ignorant child, for whom the world is new. As a child, you were carried away by thrills of emotion, by delight in the marvelous. You did not dissect the world like a dead body, or anesthetize your perception in little watertight compartments of materialism and spiritualism and monism. You submitted to the charms of legends and mysteries, and were happy, in being small, to admire powers greater than yourself. What have you gained by all this suspicious skepticism? Are you so great that the idea of the superhuman seems impossible? Or are you so ashamed of your mediocrity that the notion of suprahumanity offends you? If you are satisfied with life, ask nothing more. But if you seek the light, let us set off together as pilgrims through the light and shade of mystery. What is the mystery? Have you looked for it in yourself? Stand before a mirror and unveil, if you can, the mystery of your image. Who is that looking at you? Is it yourself? Yourself looking at yourself? No, it is the reflection and reflections are an effect of light and shadow, on something which reflects the light projected on it, or, rather, which projects itself by stopping the light. And what are you yourself, light, shadow, or thing? Of what light are you the shadow? Of what forces are you the form? Of what are you the projection? Observe your reflection and the contour of your body, which apparently delimits your life. That, the body, is the thing for which you do everything. For it you will your daily life. For it you work. For it you love. For it you fear. And you struggle to preserve its physical life, to satisfy its senses, tastes, and appetites. Look at it. Has it ever told you who it is, or what it will give you for all your trouble? Ask it. Try to extort their secret from those eyes which express so little of the struggle of a soul which is your own. Discover their meaning, if you can. Who are you, my body? You have a little world at your service all through life. Whence comes thy form, O form? Answer me. You are me. You must know me, and me, who am I, myself, or you. It's hopeless. If you shut those eyes of mine, I can still see you within myself. But you, the reflection, cannot be aware of me. So there is a myself, which knows, and a reflection? Listen now, in your breast there is something moving. Its impulses control the flow of your blood, which it receives back and sends out, without rest or pause. And it has been beating since it existed, but it has been beating without your knowledge. It beats every second of your existence. But what knowledge of it have you? Try to stop it. You cannot. Your will knows nothing of it. Only your emotion can quicken it. What? An immaterial impulse act on a physical object? Let the intellect explain that. Uncontrolled by you, that heart of yours beats out the tempo of your life. And be it fast or slow, what can you do about it? That is the tempo of your life, your rhythm, your own. Everyone has his own. What cosmic rhythm has regulated this pendulum? Do you not know, O oh most intelligent man, who obliged you to be the plaything of this mystery? Perhaps then you can understand how your food becomes transformed into your own substance, yours and not that of an animal, or how matter, 
chemically transformed by your digestion, can be finally transmuted into a living personified substance, in fact animated by the same energy as your body. It is no use to reply in chemical terms, for science must stop here. In the ultimate analysis, it can only note that the transmutation occurs without explaining the last phase of it. Neither can it explain how the minute quantity of nutritious matter which the body does not eliminate is sufficient to maintain it. In a child, this is even more striking. So great is the disproportion that its growth evidently cannot be explained, except by the reception of some external but non-material substance which encourages the multiplication of cells and blood corpuscles. This growth is a real mystery, of which the biological explanation is inadequate. But what is a mystery? We might say that a mystery is the manifestation of a causal law, which cannot be penetrated by our sensory or rational faculties. But this definition does not suggest the feeling of sanctity in a mystery. To understand that, there are mysteries in the sacred sense of the word. One must realize that we live in a world of appearances, and that in this world, as in a mirror, the image is a reversed reflection of reality. The image belongs to the world of form, through which we move with our bodies, thoughts, and senses. Reality is the world of the movements of the spirit and we live in that too, but without knowing it. The art of painting as taught in China begins with this axiom. The movement of life is created by the revolutions of the spirit. If this principle has not been yours from birth, you cannot hope to learn it. This may seem harsh, but no more so than St. Paul maintaining that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Or the Gospels, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many. And further, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. And the Christ says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world. And again, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. In clearer and more modern language we might say, if the mystery can only be perceived by the elect, that is to say, by individuals who have had from birth the faculty of perceiving the revolutions of the spirit which create the movement of life. How can you expect it to be understood by the crowd, and especially by people who are too intelligent to accept any perception other than from their material senses and their reason? Must we conclude that the perception of the world of causes is forever closed to humanity. By merely human means it is, but all the true initiators have come to earth expressly to indicate the superhuman means. And whether the world of causes be called Tao or the kingdom of heaven, the essential means for attaining it is the same, simplicity of heart and mind. <laughs>